So our next speaker is a man for whom the word impossible has no meaning. They said it could not be done. They said you could not do dynamic JVM bytecode compilation on Android. But he didn't know that. <laughs> so he said, oh, it's no problem. I'll just feed the Android Dalvik compiler into itself and run it on the Android platform. And so feed Clojure's bytecodes through the, it's like, you know, turtles eating their own tails. I, I don't even know how it works. <laughs> but uh, he's done some amazing work. And he's here to talk about Closure and Android. This is Daniel Solano Gomez. Thank you. Anyone who can't hear me, please raise your hand. Excellent. I'm going to be talking today about Closure and Android. And uh, let's see. There we go. Also, this could be called Closure in Small Places or closure to go. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the Android and its Dalvik virtual machine differ from the Java virtual machine and what this means for closure. I'll talk about how I got dynamic compilation to work, and I'll talk about closure's performance on Android in some ways that we can improve closure development on Android as a whole. So what is Android? Uh, to quote the documentation, Android is a software stack for mobile devices that provides an operating system, middleware, and key applications. So what this looks like in practice is that architecturally at the lowest level, we have the Linux kernel. Yeah. Built above that are libraries that are written generally in C or C++. And the first part of the Android architecture that's unique to Android is the, and the Dalvik virtual machine and the Android runtime. And what, the parts that you see here in blue are all written in Java. So there's some core classes, and then there's the actual application framework that developers use to develop Android applications. And finally, there's the applications themselves. So the good news to this is that we can reuse and leverage a lot of the Java ecosystem that exists out there in terms of tools and libraries. The bad news, unfortunately, is that the Java VM is not the Dalvik VM, and they differ in some very important ways. So what are these ways? There's some fairly technical things that I guess if you're into developing VMs, some of these things will mean something to you. But one of the really important ways for an application developer is Android machines are essentially you're doing embedded development. So you don't have much in the way of CPU power or heap. Yeah. And some of the really important ways that really impact us as application developers is that the APIs provided by Android are not quite the same ones that you get in standard Java. And most importantly, that the executable format on Android is not the same as the one that's used on Dalvik, which is called a Dalvik executable or a DEX file. So when you compile something in Java, you get a class file. And the class file contains a header, a constant pool, which contains things such as class constants, but also other things such as method names and class names, and then some other stuff which includes the, the code itself that you're interested in running. So in a given application, you will normally have lots of these different class files, and they're generally packaged up in a jar file. One of the problems, at least for Android, is that a lot of the constants in these constant pools are repeated and from one class to another. And so, they have their own optimized uh, file format, the DEX file, that has its own header and its own constant pool. But as you add classes to this DEX file, it doesn't repeat any of the constants. 
So adding A, B, and C. We have only one copy of each constant. And this leads to a big reduction in the application sizes. I think uh, off the top of my head, uh, closure, the jar file is about, uh, I think, three megabytes thereabouts. And it compiles down to about a one megabyte uh, DEX file. So this DEX file is included in a container, just like a jar file, which is called an APK or Android package. And this is, a, this is what your users use to install onto their device. And so when that happens, the user will unpack the DEX, or the, the, the Android runtime, will unpack the DEX file and perform some verification and optimization and the result is an optimized DEX file, or ODEX file. And that is the actual bytecodes that Android will run. So what does this mean in practice? Um, as you can tell from all the steps we had to go through, this is a very heavyweight process. It takes a lot of, a lot of time. And in particular right now, dynamically loading uh, bytecode into Android uh, from like an array of bytes in memory isn't supported. There are plans to do that at some point in the future, but there's no idea of when that will happen or how it will be when that happens. So this means that if you're interested in developing for Android, you have a choice of between strictly or ahead of time compiled uh, languages, such as Java, Clojure, Kavaski, Mira, and Scala, or you can use interpreted languages like JRuby, BeanShell, or JavaScript on Rhino. So dynamic compilation. I think we probably all know here why we want to do it. One of the wonderful things about Clojure is a dynamic, REPL-driven development. Um, typically, when you're doing Android uh, development, you can spend you know, up to a minute or more, depending on the size of your application, waiting for a new change to your code to get redeployed. In comparison, like right here, I have my REPL running. And so I can, for example, say hello. And so this is reading and evaluating, and you get the result. Now, say I'm working on the REPL itself, and I, this line of code, which I'm not sure that many of you will be able to see, um, sets up the little prompt with the namespace. So let's try doing something a little bit different. So now I am sending that S expression to Android and it just compiled. So I can execute this again, and we see that my prompt has changed. Uh, let me find, okay, there we go. So this sort of thing I used when developing the REPL, and I'll tell you what, it makes a huge difference in productivity when trying to create an application. So to review what happens when you're trying to compile some closure code. As we all know, you have some code, it gets read into a data structure, and it gets emitted eventually into a class file. And what we'd really like on Android is, is to get an ODEX file out of this. Unfortunately, with the stock closure, we cannot do that. So how do we accomplish that? Right now, in closure, the there is a class called dynamic class loader. And this class is, in, or is, in, is tasked with the responsibility of once you have some emitted byte codes, creating or instantiating the class that the, uh, that the runtime can then use. So what I've done is I split this up into two different implementations. We have the JVM dynamic class loader, which works you know, just as before. And we have the Dalvik dynamic class loader, which does some extra work. So what is this extra work? We have the first few steps that 
come from Clojure itself. This next step, taking that class file and creating a dex file out of it, I do by using some of the code that comes from the Android SDK. And so this process takes place in memory. I then package that dex file into a small APK that it's saved onto the file system. And at that point, I can use the Android SDK to load up that dex file and make it available for use. So how do we know which one of these things to use? I created a new var in Clojure Core for the different VM types. And I look at the system property, java.vm.name, to see am I running on Dalvik or not. And if so, I can set that var to the appropriate value and change the behavior uh, of Clojure itself. And so one of the consequences of being able to accomplish this is a new dependency uh, on that piece of code that can turn a class file into a dex file. And right now, I'm just pulling the necessary classes out of the dx.jar that comes with the Android SDK. Unfortunately, I have found uh, that this is a somewhat fragile process. And really, a source-based dependency is a better way to go. My dynamic uh, class loading logic can work on pretty much all modern versions of Android. Only uh, over 97% you know, can use this code. And as far as Clojure itself is concerned, concerned you know, what can you or can you not do on Clojure with the dynamic compilation aspect of Android? And really, you can do pretty much everything. Uh, I have found, or some people have found, uh, that some macros can, when they're compiling, blow the stack. Um, also, any APIs in Clojure that depend upon APIs are not in Android, like the Java that means uh, package, or in Clojure 1.3, the Clojure.repl namespace, those things won't work. But just about everything else will work just fine. And to maintain compatibility outside of Android, I've ensured that any Android-related classes are loaded reflectively. So that way, you don't have to include all this extra stuff if you're not interested in running on, and on Android itself. So you know, how, how does it perform? What I, I performed an experiment where I have an absolute minimal Hello World type app and implemented it in several different languages. And I just want to see you know, how much overhead does the language uh, create. So the first one that, that's of interest is package size. Android users are oftentimes downloading your application over expensive or slow internet connections, wireless internet connections. So the idea is, is that the, the smaller that you can keep your package, the better it is for, for your user. Likewise, once it's installed on the machine and gets all expanded, you want to keep it as small as possible because you know, these machines don't have the much, that much in the way of disk space. And usually there's only about a gigabyte or so allocated for applications. The big thing that your users are going to realize is that when they want to start your application, how long does it take from the point where they tap on the application icon and they see something on the screen? And at least on my Nexus S phone, the minimum, which you know, comes from Java and Scott, is about 400 milliseconds. I found that closure takes about 2.3 seconds thereabouts. So whether or not this is acceptable really depends on the type of application that you're running. Some applications um, are going to be taking a long time to load anyway, because they're either pulling something off the network or pulling something off disk. And so an extra 2.4 seconds might not make that much of a difference. But other applications, you really want to pop up as soon as a user clicks on something. And so this is one of the, I think, probably the biggest drawback right now to closure on Android. Likewise, as I mentioned, Android phones and tablets are generally relatively small spaces. You don't have a lot of heap available for you. And so 
you want to keep the amount of overhead that comes from your tools and your language from, from being too big. Because the more it takes up, the less you have for your application. And I find that closure adds about 1.2 megabytes to your heap. So where did all the time and space go? Unfortunately, it's closure.core. This is something we can't really get rid of. <laughs> so I did some benchmarking and profiling, or profiling, I already showed you the benchmarking, now I'll show you profiling. And the biggest consumer of memory, about a, a fifth of it, is the closure core underscore underscore init class, which is the class that kind of bootstraps a, a namespace. And as I understand that most of this is just due to all the metadata that's included as part of closure.core. So all your doc strings and arg lists and all these sorts of things, which don't really matter for your, for your application, they're loaded into memory anyway. Um, some other big space hogs that we see here are some of the namespace mappings themselves. These are the objects that have all the symbols and the mappings to the appropriate uh, vars. And one of the things that surprised me is the in and out. These are the wrappers to system.in and system.out, which are useful if you're doing stuff on a closure REPL, but on an Android application, you don't really need these. So what about time? I created another example, or another uh, experiment where I have a Java application that executes this one line of code, which essentially just call, adds one, two, and three. And so I wanted to see you know, how long does this take? And I ran this within the same application twice. So I had a button that I just press it and adds one, two, and three. And what we see here is that the code, the time that it takes to actually execute, you know, you know getting the var and invoking it uh, is very, very small, about a, you know, less than a millisecond. But the first time that you try it, it takes nearly eight seconds. Now don't pay too much attention on the specific number this is done using a, memory, uh, or a method profiler, so this is much slower, but the magnitudes are really what's of interest here. So what took so long? Um, there, it's loading that runtime class is what took all the time. In particular, as part of the class uh, construction, and there's a doInit method. And what that doInit method is two different things. One, it loads the closure core namespace, and that's something that we need and we want. But it also creates the user namespace and imports all the, binding, uh, the bindings from closure core into that user namespace. And again, if you're working on the REPL, that's great. That gives you your place to experiment. But on your Android application, you don't really need that. And I find that commenting out that, those lines of code and rerunning my experiment, that it did take off about one eighth of that uh, loading time, which was about 300 milliseconds. One other thing that you would notice when running this benchmark is there is a lot of garbage collection going on. Uh, the concurrent garbage collector on my device kicks off about five or six times uh, during that load of closure core. And what we see here is that there's an immense amount of object churn, about a 300% turnover rate. And as I understand it, this is as a result of building up all that metadata. And since we have the, our persistent data structures, which we all know and love, unfortunately, here they're hurting us a little bit. So what are some ideas for improving performance? One, as I mentioned, at least on Android, you can get rid of that user namespace. We don't need it. Um, removing metadata is an idea that I know is out there, that, uh, that is something that some of Closure Core is looking into, and I think that would help out immensely. Uh, I don't know if this is possible or not. I mean, some ideas also to help, are either maybe using some sort of transient while you're loading, uh, since you know that at least at that point, you should theoretically only be running in a single thread. 
uh, or if there's some way to just kind of serialize everything so that you can just kind of unload it from, from disk or memory or, what, or into memory. Ultimately, I think one thing that would help a lot but uh, is a very difficult problem would be some sort of uh, tree shaker that can analyze your code and figure out what functions you're not using and just make sure they don't get compiled in. But um, I, I think some of these other things are probably easier and uh, more likely to happen. So aside from improving in performance, what are some other sorts of things that can help closure development for Android? One of these, I think, is some sort of standard library. And I started working on, on something uh, earlier in the year, which I call Neko. And it mostly just is a library to help you with a lot of the, the boilerplate that's, that becomes necessary in dealing with Android's very object-oriented APIs to you know, kind of smooth it out and make it more friendly to Clojure's functional approach. And I'd really love, I guess I need to probably bring this up on a Devel mailing list, but I'd love to maybe see this uh, become a contrib library. So what kind of development tools can we improve, you know, can be improve, what kind of development tools would help us improve the development experiments, experience? Uh, one of which, I have mentioned, is a dynamic compilation version of Clojure, which is available on GitHub and has been for some time. Um, unfortunately, I haven't had the time to really care for it and up, update it to Clojure 1.3. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, a better, more robust dependency on the DX jar would be better. And I would love for some of these changes to be integrated into the mainstream closure. I have included in the standard library some XML files that can help you integrate with the Android SDK's build process to just make it easier to, to integrate Clojure into our project. It'd be really nice to see like a Leiningen plugin or something else, you know, for, that's more Clojure friendly for people who are interested in doing this sort of development. Um, likewise, I, I'm one of those Vim users. And, <laughs> and as I showed you, that I, I included a Vim Clojure, you know, server component into my REPL, which helped me in my own development. And I think it'd be really great to see like a, a Swank server or other such tools to help people who prefer other editors uh, to be able to have the same sort of development experience. So to wrap things up, I want to mention a little bit about ClojureScript. This is something I had really hoped to be able to take some more time to look into in depth. Unfortunately, I didn't, so I'm giving you some thoughts kind of off the top of my head, more or less. I mean, of course, if you're having a web app, there's nothing that keeps you from using ClojureScript. Um, there are a number of cross-platform development frameworks that use JavaScript. I don't know how well they would work together with ClojureScript. I guess it's the interop problem that we are talking about earlier today. Now, as far as actual doing native development with JavaScript or ClojureScript, right now the main problem are the JavaScript uh, uh, engines that are available for the JVM. There's Rhino, which is very slow. There is V8, which I believe has imported to Android, but unfortunately that works at kind of a native C, C++ layer. So it doesn't really give you a good opportunity to access the Android APIs. Uh, there's been suggestion of using the scripter lang scripting layer for Android, but unfortunately, it doesn't do a very good job of exposing all of the Android APIs either. Um, to do a complex GUI with the SL4A, I find um, you have to use a web view. So it's essentially like writing a web app. I think that overall, Clojure has what it takes to be a really great first-class language for Android development. And in particular, I think the dynamic REPL-driven aspect of it 
is a killer feature. It changes the way that you develop. Instead of having to you know, maybe try to code as much as you can in, so that way you can avoid that whole you know, waiting a minute, minute and a half for, to be able to see what happens in your code, it's still not as fast. You can do it in a few seconds using uh, this sort of you know, REPL backend that's installed on the device itself. And I think that if we have more community involvement in developing some of these tools that I've mentioned, then I think you know, we can see Clojure becoming a really great language for Android development. And as a result, I'll, um, a suggestion from yesterday's Birds of a Feather session, I have created a mailing list, Clojure Android, uh, to help, um, help, I guess, this community kind of build up and start coordinating. And um, I'll put a, a posting to the main closure mailing list uh, to let people know about that. I am working on a book for O'Reilly. Um, it's called Decaffeinate Android. So it's about developing Android applications without using Java. And my primary focus is on JVM languages. So we'll see Scala and Clojure at least being the first two languages that I tackle. So this will probably be coming out sometime next year. And that's it for me. Any questions? I guess my, the Clojure REPL is available on the Android market. You can scan the QR code or just look it up.